Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Kucha. In this video, we'll be taking a look at financial management part three. We'll be taking a look at the legal framework around reporting. So again, to remind ourselves, so far in this series, we have evaluated the cyclical process of financial management, that is budgeting to the counting to reporting. We are right now. Uh, we've also taken a look at the rules governing the budget process at each level of government. So that was the first step of that cyclical process, rules, legal framework around the budget. We jumped over the accounting side, and now we're going to be taking a look at the legal framework around the reporting side. We also took a look at some common budgeting techniques. That was video two. And here we will continue and finish off with the final part of our financial management cycle. Okay, what's our goal here? What are we aiming to do? Well, by the end of this session, we will be able to differentiate between the different reporting requirements at different levels of government. So again, different levels of government, that's going to be federal, provincial, and local. Now, when we're talking about provincial and local levels, we're talking about provincial as in where we currently are, British Columbia, BC, and when we're talking about the local levels, we're talking about the legal framework imposed on the local levels by the provincial government, keeping in mind that the local level of government doesn't really have any authority bestowed upon it by the Constitution. Rather, the legal, the legal authority of that local level is entirely as dictated, entirely underneath the umbrella of the provincial government. Okay. That being said, let's start off. Let's begin by evaluating the reporting requirements for the federal government. I should highlight again the fact for this video, it's been a common theme throughout all three of these. For the most part, this is going to be me talking, me just expressing a bunch of information and maybe a bit of divergence as well as I go off topic, but primarily it's going to be me talking. There's going to be very limited use of my writing or demonstration on the Blackboard. Uh, my use here will primarily be to accent or to really punctuate what I'm saying to highlight the main points. That being said, again, if you want to just put this on, put your phone or whatever device you're using kind of on a screen off mode and just listen to the beautiful sound of my voice, please feel free to do so. Uh, that is going to be the main focus of this. If there's anything that really needs to draw your attention back to the Blackboard, which there really isn't going to be in this video, I will let you know ahead of time. Outside of that, anything that does end up here, like I said, just kind of punctuates or highlights a key point that I'm talking about. And again, in doing so, I'll probably state it as well. So starting off with the federal government. Financial statements for the federal government, that is the government of Canada, they are prepared by the receiver general. And that pause there is just me writing receiver general to highlight that point. So the receiver general is the one who prepares and publishes this every year under the title of Public Accounts of Canada. That's the title of this reporting document. Public Accounts of Canada. And this is no small task. Uh, this Public Accounts of Canada is all done with the accordance with the Financial Administration Act. And these public accounts are prepared every year for fiscal year end. Uh, when is fiscal year end? Fiscal year end is the 31st of March. So every year for the 31st of March, these need to be prepared. And like I said, they're no small task. They are released in three volumes. Okay, so a lot of paper, a lot of, well, nowadays it's mostly digital, um, but a lot of text, a lot of information there. Uh, what, is the, what are these three volumes? What's going on in each one? Uh, the first volume is a summary and a summary of the analysis of the financial transactions of the government. So all the financial transactions of the government, it's just a summarization of it and analysis of it. Volume two is financial operations of the government by ministry or by department. Uh, third is just additional information and analysis. So three volumes altogether the summary of the financial transactions, the financial operations of government by department ministry, 
and then the third volume, additional information and analysis. For our purposes, the point that really is interesting to us is actually going to be in volume one, section two. And in volume one, section two are all the audited financial statements and really four different parts in this that are interested to us. So first part, volume one, section two, statements of operations and accumulated deficit. If you were to refer this to kind of your private equivalent of financial statements, this would be the profit loss statement in the private sector. So a listing of all your revenues and expenditures in order to determine whether or not you finished off with a profit surplus or a loss deficit. So that's really where this one uh, where this one would fit if you were to kind of look at the private sector equivalent. Second one would be a statement of financial position. This one here, again, if we were to relate it back to the private sector, this would be similar to the balance sheet. So this would be a listing of all your assets, a listing of all your liabilities. The big difference is we're on the private sector, you would have your equity position, right? Your equity of your shareholders. That doesn't really exist in the public sector. We don't have shareholders. Next big part to look at would be the statement of the change in net debt. This statement of change in net debt, this is essentially a summary of all the factors affecting net debt. So all of the factors that either make the net debt grow or that are going in to decrease the amount you have in debt. Finally, number four, the last statement of interest is going to be our statement of cash flow. Which again, if we were to bring that over to its uh, private sector equivalent, this would be a reconciliation of change in cash balances year on year. So, hey, are we carrying more cash than we were last year or are we carrying less? This section altogether, so again, we're referring to volume one, section two. This section also includes any observations of the Auditor General on the financial statements. So the Auditor General, really the big wig auditor for the federal government that provides really the auditing of all public federal department services and budgets. The Auditor General also performs additional performance audits on behalf of Parliament. So these can be for specific programs, specific departments, uh, specific services, in order to ensure that the programs are being managed efficiently and effectively. And then again, attached to that is with due regard for environmental impact as well. So big things that the Auditor General looks at, essentially making sure that, hey, public funds, public resources are not being misappropriated. So big role there and Auditor General's role in evaluating and their observances, their observations rather, in all of these statements in the dealings of the federal government. Jumping over to the provincial side, so we've taken a look at the federal government, the government of Canada, now the government of BC. Well, the government of BC is also required to prepare annual financial statements by year end. Again, same year end of the 31st of March annually. Um, this one here is done by the Office of the Comptroller General. So that's the Office of the, I'm just writing down, Comptroller General. Such that the Comptroller General publishes this underneath the title of public accounts. So keep in mind at the federal level, these were public accounts of Canada. At the provincial level, these are just published under the title of public accounts. This is of course all done in accordance with the Provincial Financial Administration Act. Altogether, this document isn't three volumes in length, but rather just five sections. The first section there is just the overview, the kind of highlight summary of everything else that's going to be showing up. The second, the second section is going to be the summary of financial statements. This summary of sta financial statements, this is very similar to those four sections that we saw in the federal volume one, section two. That is the statement of operations, the statement of financial position, the statement of change in net liabilities, and the statement of change in cash flows. So big parts there all showing up underneath this section two, summary of financial statements. Section three will be supplementary information. Section four is a consolidated view of all of our revenue funds. 
And finally, Section 5 is just a summary of the provincial debt. Similar to the Auditor General at the federal level, there's also the Auditor General for BC. Very similar roles. Difference is, is it's just the provincial counterpart part. So again, the role of the auditor, the provincial auditor general would be to evaluate the provincial budgets to ensure that provincial funds are not misappropriated and uh, similarly to uh, conduct these performance audits on behalf of the provincial legislature. Again, in order to determine that ministries and provincial programs are being properly managed, being effectively and efficiently run. So then that brings us over to local government. So on the local government side, again, local government, all of the regulatory, all of the legal framework on this point is dictated by the senior levels of government, most notably the provincial government. Uh, in accordance with, again, the community charter, and in this case here, so again, we're looking at budgeting, we talked about our uh, community charter, such that the community charter kind of outlined the rules, the regulations, the authorities in which local governments have, well, here underneath section 167 of the community charter, it outlines really what local governments must do for their reporting side. And in this case here, it states that local governments must submit audited, council approved annual financial statements to the inspector of municipalities. So, right, that's a provincial, a provincial title, a provincial office whose role of course it is to inspect municipalities and ensure that the municipalities are uh, not misappropriating funds and being responsible to their constituents this document this report must be submitted to the inspector of municipalities by the 15th of may each year uh, these statements must be prepared according to generally accepted accounting principles that is gap and the generally accounted, sorry, the generally accepted accounting principles for local government. Uh, these audited statements must form part of their annual report that must be made available to the public by June 30th. So they must be submitted to the inspector of municipalities by the 15th of May, and then must be available for public reading by June 30th. Over the years, these reports have faced numerous reviews, numerous criticisms, and numerous problems. Primarily, there was a lot of concern that these reports were extremely different from one municipality to another, from one region to another. This made it very difficult for independent observers or for private citizens to be able to compare the financial well-being or the spending of municipal, local, regional funds in one area compared to the next. Uh, in order to allow for an ease in comparison, in order to allow for an ease of evaluation of the effectiveness of local government, there has been uh, the commission, rather, the provincial and actually the federal government, pushed for the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants to form the Public Sector Accounting Board, uh, that is the PSAB. The PSAB, the Public Sector Accounting Board, their role was to research and issue financial statement standards for all Canadian municipalities. They came up with a report, they came up with suggestions, with recommendations as to how municipalities, how these regional governments should compile and what they should and should not include in these annual reports. BC has accepted all the PSAB's recommendations for implementation. Took a few years from the point of acceptance to the point of actually rolling them in, because of course there was some kickback, there were some disagreements around certain items, but as of today, these have now all been implemented. Uh, the BC local government statements, they typically consist of at least these following three aspects. Of course, they may consist of more, but through the PSAB, through this, this is kind of our guaranteed at least they will contain a statement of financial position. In addition to this, they will include a statement of financial activities, that is, of all their operations. And finally, a statement of change in financial position. So that is ultimately going to be their cash flow document. Do they have any increase, a decrease in cash flows? So at minimum, we're going to witness these three aspects on a local government's annual report. 
although there's no public auditor general at the local level, right? We saw that there was the auditor general for the federal government, an auditor general for the provincial government that kind of provided their own observations, their own kind of recommendations through this annual report. We don't see this at the local level. Instead, the inspector that is the inspector of municipalities, they may require a local government to hire an auditor to provide additional financial reports or to look into additional services, departments, or programs provided by the local government to kind of look for irregularities or to ensure that these to ensure that these programs are being delivered in the most cost effective, efficient manner. Right. Well, likely that wasn't the most exciting or entertaining of videos, but throughout this video, what we have done is we've evaluated the legal framework and showed the different reporting regulations for different levels of government, starting off with the federal level. And we took a look at how the federal government has its legislation, the requirements for reporting annually for them. Moving on to the provincial, seeing really much of the same, just to not as great of a degree. Federal government had three volumes of financial reports that came out, where the provincial government came out with a single report of five sections. Moving on down to the local government, we see that this is even less intensive still yet. It is just a simpler financial statement with just three minimum kind of components to it. Of course, sometimes these local governments will contain more, but definitely these three aspects at minimum. Uh, what I can say is that in the description below, I have linked to both, I uh, shouldn't say both, but rather to all, a federal year-end report, a provincial year-end report, as well as a year-end report for a local government that is for the city of Victoria. You can find a link to all of these in the description. That wraps up for this week, taking a look at financial management. In the upcoming week, what we will evaluate is the Canadian revenue system. That is specifically evaluating sources of revenue available to different levels of government, again, federal, provincial, and local, as well as some main theories and controversies surrounding taxation. If you have any questions or comments regarding anything we've covered in this video, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to post on D2L. And of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.